The Stoa is a digital campfire where we cohere in dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of what's happening now. Okay. Um, so this is the fourth session of the hollow and we are looking at causality. And of course, all these are kind of entangled with each other. You know, if we have a certain conception of time, then it's going to mold our concept and conception of change. And those two together mold our conception of um, causality. And as we move to causality, uh, it gets much more complicated to disembed ourselves from the habitual way of thinking of causality. Because basically when we say causality, we think that something is triggering something else. You know, we, we, we think of this billiard ball method that something has to hit something else that makes hit something else, it hits something else. We can hardly think of causality. We can hardly use that word and not have this creep into the conversation. So for example, um, and this is a Newtonian conception because Newton said that an object is a dead thing. And if it's in motion, it'll just stay in motion. Uh, if it's not in motion, it will not move unless it gets hit by a force. And our, so our notion of causality is dualistic. We have inanimate objects and then we have forces that move, that, that move them. This is our basic Western conception of causality. So you even have, for example, in the West, you have a question of free will. Do I have free will? And if you look at that question, it's based on the assumption of, well, if I have a thought, an intention to move my arm, okay, the intention moves my arm, but then what gives me the intention? Well, that must come from the environment. It's, it's the same thing. We trap ourselves into a uh, paradox or a non sequitur because when I ask myself, do I have free will? I lock myself into, well, what moves the arm? My intention, what moves my intention? Oh, my, maybe my hormones, what moves my hormones? And then I start to think, oh, I don't have free will, it's all deterministic. So this, this getting disembedding from the mo modern sense of causality has to do with really catching yourself um, playing this kind of game. And we're gonna look at systems thinking today is actually still in this side of this game. And it's this notion of what is got the power, the force and what is de-animated. We want to look at, can we have causality that doesn't require an external force? Because then where does the external force come from? It's all, again, it's all very loopy. So, um, ex uh, <clears throat> contrast this with, um, this is a video from a TED talk in this, in this right-hand corner here. And what you're going to see is, you're going to see how, um, can you, oh, man. Can you still see me? Can you hear me, Rainy? Okay, because my screen. Yeah, I can hear you, but your video doesn't seem to be coming through. Your, I mean, your your camera. Okay, let's start start again. But the presentation is working. Yeah. Okay, so is it work? Is it still working now? Is it better now? It's better now, right? Okay. So what you're going to see here is a video of ribosomes. Ribosomes are little factories, they're little service stations in your cells that unravel your DNA and make, make reproductions of the DNA. Oh, man. So if you look at this, this is like a miracle, right? There's millions and millions of ribosomes in your body, many, many in your cells. And these molecules 
are achieving something that we don't even really understand, right? But what's moving them? Is there something external causing this molecule to move this way, causing this molecule to move this way? I mean, this is what we want, we go looking for as biochemists, chemists. But when you think about it, it's the same way, there's, there's, something, <clears throat> there's something in our thought process that is being added to what's happening, right? So for example, if I take, um, if I take a magnet, right? It's just a piece of iron and I wrap copper around it, what happens? Well, I get electricity, right? The, the electrons will flow from in the magnet because the magnet creates a disequilibrium of the electrons in which they were first, the way they were first configured and then they move, okay? So what we say is there's the magnet, there's the copper wire, and then we say there's electricity. But you see the word electricity is what the Buddhists would call a conceptual elaboration. We take that and we create a third term as if, oh, there's electricity there. When there's really just a magnet and copper and these, this configuration of these bodies, copper and iron, when, they, when the bodies are together, it causes movement. Do you see how like the word electricity is just a kind of, a but that's not really there. It's an interpretation. It, we add the third term to describe the phenomenon because we wanna say, well, where's the force? And so then we say the force is the electricity because we're allergic to saying that the atoms themselves have certain properties of animation that when they're in relationship with other atoms that have different properties of animation, then things happen. The term electricity is the third term because we're always trying to find the force that moves things. And then this is how we get hooked up in, we get hooked on this hidden notion of linear causality, even in uh, what seems like complex systems. Okay, so if in the- Nita, you're- your camera is still not coming through. The presentation is, but the, the video on the presentation didn't come through and your camera is not coming through for some reason. Okay, let's try something. Okay, now we can see you. Benita, you're muted. You need, I need to, you have to give me permission to share again. Technology doesn't want me talking about how there's no cause and effect, you see. The AI is uh, the AI is um, sabotaging this. Um, okay, so um, so let's 
uh, backtrack a little bit. In the East, um, they, this is Nagarjuna, but in the uh, first Buddha, um, he had this notion of causality. We can see this notion of causality actually arising in the East with the first Buddha. And he talked about, he applied causa a theory of causality to suffering. So you have the wheel of suffering. And there's like 13 leverage points of this, this reactivity on the wheel of suffering. But this is actually linear cause and effect, right? Th this, you know, um, attachment or desire causes this, and this causes this, and this causes this, and then this is the wheel of suffering. But when Nakajuna came along, he and his students really looked at something very um, uh, sophisticated. They looked at a theory of causation that included mental events. Um, they said that the state of the, your subjective state is you know, a mental event, but it's implicated causally in the world. So we could think, for example, about if someone is having a paranoid uh, episode and, and like, if I think you're gonna kill me, this is a complete illusion, but it changes my behavior such that I might kill you first, right? And so Nagarjuna was interested in how so that's a very, that's an extreme example, but he was saying that even subtle, even subtle conditions in the human are dispositional states to act some ways and not in others. And that if you change the state of the person, the subtle state of the person, then the behaviors change, the perceptions change, the choices change, and that is, causally effective in the real world. So, um, and it wasn't like he was saying, if I have this thought, then I'm going to do that. He was talking about something very sophisticated, what I call numinous causality. That something changing in the interior relationship of a system changes, is associated with concrete changes that change the whole. So it's not as linear as that because when you look at the system, the state of the system, what's happening that there is totally not linear. So he was actually the first person that was, or the school scholastics that were really looking at what's called implicate causation or what Roy Bashkar would go on to call causally effective illusions. And one of the things that I want you to keep in the back of your mind today, because we're gonna look at complex adaptive systems theory. And what I'm saying, gonna say, or the suggest is the fact that we see the world through the lens of complex adaptive systems makes us respond to events in the world in a way that's problematic. Because in complex adaptive system thinking, everything is reacting and adapting to everything else. So you have an escalating arms race. So vaccines and viruses, pesticides and pests, markets and economies. And so you end up being able to show Get, get evidence that these systems are complex adaptive, but it's a closed loop because you, you're, you think you have a metaphysics of complex adaptive systems, changes your behavior, which actualizes the metaphor of causality that you have. And what I'm saying is we need to get out of the causal loop called complex adaptive systems. And then we'll talk about complex potential states as an alternative. And it's everywhere. It's very hard to get out of this. I spent years asking myself, what would nature be like? What would medicine be like? What would writing a book on education, not as adapting developmental adaptation, but unfolding potential that's already there? But of course, in the West, again, we look at the human as what's causing the attention, 
you know, the, the human has an intention or a desire. Well, what's causing that? There's got to be an external force because a human can't be self-animated. The force has to come from somewhere else. So we have, this is a lot of where our psycho psychological theory comes from, but there has to be some kind of psychological force that causes the intention, that causes the movement. It's this, this constant like externalizing the behavior, the action, the self-animation. We don't even see people as self-animated. And when we look at complex adaptive systems theory, there's a sense in which we convince ourselves that the system acts on the person and the person cannot act on the system, right? So we have management theories where like the manager can leverage the human system from a privileged position because they're the outside force. So we constantly manufacturing or constructing causality as if the force comes from outside and acts on the system from a privileged position. Again, this notion of where is the animation coming from? This person is doing something. Where, you know, what's causing that person to do something? Rather than what's unfolding from the self. Do you see the difference? What's causing that? What's causing that? What's causing that? Versus like, wow, look at this potential that's unfolding. How can I work with that? That there's, there's a sense in which you see the organism or the person or the ribosome or the molecule as whole in itself and its wholeness includes its potential to animate, to move, to act, to create relationships. The potential's in the essential element. It's not waiting for something to move it along. And this is how we teach, you know, this is how we, we, we train our children, you see? We train our children versus like, what's the potential to be a human being that I can work with here and help scaffold? No, that I have to train the children. People have to steward the earth. It's always this sense that there's gotta be an outside actor. And then we put ourselves also in that place, like evolution exerts pressure on me. Well, that's just a complete metaphysical construct that there's something like evolution exerting pressure. I've even written this in organization, my organizational work. Increasing pressure exerted by the environment on organizations is causing them, you see? There's always this external force that something else is adapting to. Versus in complex potential states, you say, an organization is a group of people. And the fact that they're relating creates potential from the inside. That's all it is. It's a completely re different reframe. And in the, pro in the problem with always looking at the force acting from the outside is you deanimate the agent and you don't see the potential from within. And even language that talks about potential, you know, we, we have like uh, kinetic potential, the, the potential for something to move when it gets hit. It's still waiting from a force from the outside. This I think is part of the reason why young people, they, 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 they're not self-motivated. I work with high school students. They have all this talent and they're like, okay, well, what do we do now? And you're like, like, just do it. But they, they're saying, well, but I need a motivation or, you know, they're waiting for the outside thing to come and hit them. We could go on and on, as obviously I can go on and on all day, but this is the essential uh, conceptual move, move here. So if we pivot to uh, climate causality in this global meta crisis, I want to say that we're, we're going to, we, again, we default to the Darwinian attitude, but it has a, um, a history. So at first, when we looked at nature, this is highly reductive, but basically um, 
before Darwin, we just saw the species were competing with each other for life and death, survival. We didn't have anything like survival of the fittest. We didn't have a notion of evolution. And so here you just have agents acting on other agents. This was before we systematized understanding of nature. And then something very interesting happens when we started systematizing nature, when we started to see nature as an evolving system. We acted as understanding nature as a system like ecology is that we could grab it by its tail and make it do something because we understand it now. And so this shows, for example, now the man is not just an equal participant actor within nature, but the man has a leverage point by which he can destroy nature. There's an asymmetrical relationship here. This is what Daniel Schmattenberger talks about. That looking at nature as an external system and we are the force that can act on it is basically destroying nature. It's like looking at climate and finding the leverage point in carbon. Carbon's the problem. If I act on the carbon, then the climate will fix itself. It's very linear causation. So this is the leverage point we're always looking for. And of course, he, in this picture you see in the process of taming or grabbing nature by the tail, if you look in the background over there, it's destroyed nature. And of course, now we bring the same kind of thinking into human systems. And we talk about managers using complexity theory, like chaos theory and complexity theory to leverage points in the organization to steer the organization or get co competitive advantage or stuff like that. There's a subtle arrogance and a subtle reductive um, reduction of really rich systems in all complex adaptive systems thinking. So if you take something like the Kneffen framework and you add it, you, you, the, and you use the theory of change of complex adaptive systems, you have the same problem. And of course, now we are exporting the same leverage to the earth itself, as if we can occupy a position outside the earth. And these, this is a picture, this is a real photograph of all the satellites around the earth. Right, as if we could be outside the earth from a privileged position and work on it versus participate within the biosphere. So this is, we've persistently had this sense, even when in systems thinking that there's a leverage point that we can grab the system by its tail and work on it. And this again is like there's a force and the earth is deanimated. The AI is deanimating the earth. The AI is going to get in between all this information and tell the earth micromanage the earth. It's completely deanimated the entire earth. In 1956, this worried Hannah Arendt when she saw the pictures coming back from space. She said, now that we can see the earth as one thing, this is what we're going to do. We're gonna objectify the earth and act on it, have the attitude of acting on it. And so she used the metaphor of the Archimedes our committee said, give me a lever long enough and I'll move the earth, right? So he had to be somewhere in space with a lever long enough. And so she says, we have found a way to act on the earth as though we dispose of it from the outside. And what I'm saying is the leverage point is not out there, it's in 
here, like Nagarjuna said, it's in the mental events and our subjective disposition. So right now we're working not so much with our subjective disposition, but the mental events we use that animate our behavior. And can we find choice here? So now, of course, we take this in the Anthropocene, we take it one step further. Because now what has happened is the background that we've supposedly tamed rears its head and becomes foreground. It becomes yet again, the agent that we're struggling with. This is in our imagination. And so we see that we've, the, the, it's completely recursive because we've tried to act on the earth as if from outside. And now all of a sudden, there's all this language of climate, climate crisis and um, we're, 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 we're being threatened by the climate. I mean, these things are true, but we're making the climate again, something that we have to adapt to. And then the climate adapts to us and then carbon adapts to us. And we continually use the Darwinian attitude and complex adaptive states thinking. And this just exacerbates the problem. The solution and the problem are in the same mentality. So you have something that people all over the mo modern world think this makes sense. Can evolution outrun climate change? Right? This, this, is, this makes sense in our popular imagination, but it's completely erroneous way to look at what it is to be a living organism in the biosphere. But it's so inside, so habituated to our popular imagination the Darwinian attitude and complex adaptive systems thinking. <clears throat> now there's a handful of authors, um, Vicki McCabe, Stephanie Wakefield, William O'Connolly, uh, David Chandler, who I, I, I call post-anthropic for two reasons. They're not, they're not interested in looking at these situations in an anthrop from an anthropocentric point of view and they really are not interested in seeing the Anthropocene as putting us under threat. Like it's now, nature is now the enemy. So um, Chandler says, we are beginning to think of ourselves individually and collectively as people under siege, climate threat. Uh, yes, life is precarious. We need not pretend we are discovering this for the first time. Modernist assumptions of securing the human against the world, right? This is what we're trying to do. Make the world a safe place. Let's put satellites. We can monitor all the carbon and all the ozone and all the fires. And it's precisely the problem that needs to be overcome. The world is not an environment that requires an adaptive response from us. What is required from us is a transformation in perception of the world from threat to be solved to a field of mutuality and possibility. This is why complex adaptive systems thinking doesn't help us because just like everything else, we're gonna see climate as a threat, then we try to adapt to that and it's gonna to try to adapt to us and it's just gonna exacerbate the problem. In many cases, maybe it's better just like to stop and see what's going on. See how climate change creates new openings. Wait until your perception is transformed. So <clears throat> just some bullets on what a theory of complex potential states would uh, feel like. It's not that conceptual. Um, but first of all, this notion you have to become the first mover. 
You don't move in reaction to some pressure or some threat. You have to, and this is an interesting psychodynamic process. Um, I have stories I can tell you that uh, moved me into this direction. But basically when you realize that you can create enough spaciousness, so you're not actually responding or reacting to anything, you're creating something as if it's completely new. And this is definitely possible. Um, and it happened when I lost my job and you know, I was in contracting, everything, you're always responding when you're in business, you're reacting, every, it's, a, you know, it's like called the rat race. But then I lost my job and I had all this time and all this space and uh, yeah, I didn't know what to do with it. Like, what was I reacting to? There was just space and time. And I watched how life puts itself back together, that life is self-ordering. And not really because I was reacting to anything. There was just a void. I look into the future and it was just a void. So this notion of what is it to become a first mover is a really deep question because 99.9% .9 of the way you probably make decisions is because you feel either that you have to achieve something in the future or you're running away from a pressure that you're trying to get away of. What if those two things those, the externality of forces dropped away. You would feel the movement from inside, from your, your own unique dispositional state. And it wouldn't be something like some kind of psychological trauma that you're trying to heal from the past. But even the way we understand ourselves is through all this kind of linear causation that set up all these, these nuts and bolts and that we're, we, we imagine us to be like Rube Goldberg machines, right? And we look at our children this way, which I think is really, really, um, really a significant problem. Okay. So a theory of complex potential states incorporates Whitehead's notion of a stream brimming with pluripotentiality flowing toward action. And we looked at <clears throat> some of this in the slides on time where you have all these infinite array of potentials. It works with the notion that the coherent state that emerges as action only unfolds some of the potentials that there's potentials that subsist in the background that are causally affect implicate. Uh, these, those potentials not selected are in a sense left behind and they remain causally implicated. Um, this is a complete different type of metaphor than the metaphors of modernity. We talked about these metaphysical primes as theory constitutive metaphors. This is a whole new way to move into a theory of change or a theory of causality. So William Connolly writes it this way. He's one of these handful of uh, thinkers that are, they're onto something, right? He says, you know, he borrows from Whitehead these, these, some of these uh, features. He says the open plurality that preceded the selection before the new moment came on, now simmers in the background of being, available to enter into future vibrations when a new situation arises. Like there's more affordances than what meets the eye. We talked about this last time. If I see a beaver pond, the forest is still there in the background. This notion of appearance and disappearance and taking out of existence, but having the potential still subsisting in the background. This is a completely new mind. This is not a modernist mind, this William Connolly. He writes, this is his, the way he's explaining how he's feeling into this new post-anthropic awareness. Loose instinctual residues from a past that never was periodically exert pressure on life. 
The scar left behind, however, scar is I think a problematic term, but there's only so many words in the English language, bristles with uncertain potential. It may be activated under new circumstance, forging an uncanny relation with the new situation from which a new bout of creative energy arises. A new idea, feeling, tactic, perception, desire, plan of inspiration may bubble into being as if from nowhere. I call it new, numinous ca causality. It feels like it's from nowhere and everywhere at the same time, that the whole universe bursts into this situation or this action that is you. We looked at that last time with that long timeline. What all the implicate relationships that are required to be you. He says, creativity thus forms an uncanny element of human relations. You know, he's, this is arguments for this first mover type of potential. Creativity is a critical element because freedom would be flat or dead if it did not radiate with the potential to becoming something new. The process is uncanny because creativity is neither the simple result of a preformed intention nor the realization of a preordained principle waiting to be elaborated. So, um, you know, these are excerpts from a, a small book. Um, and I'm not saying that they're completely self explanatory, but can you hear that this is a, not a modernist mind? It's outside. We, the very first, uh, I think, slide we talked about. Are, can we see modernity from someplace else? And people like William Connolly are seeing it from somewhere, someplace else. Stepping outside, this is emergence of a new mind at the scale of, let's say, the axial age. So what occurred to me during this slide is something really cool using his language, this gives us another meaning of being in, in a time in between. Perhaps mm -hmm. we are inhabiting a world of subsisting potentials. Perhaps this is only a partially formed world that's not consolidated because in fact, another fork had been taken that we're in the subsisting potentials that are not actualized. It gave me a new metaphor for thinking of the time in between worlds. Perhaps the world in between is the fork not taken. We're somehow in the teletransporter room and not quite made it back to the bridge. And we subsist as a partially crystallized instinct of collected arrested thought imbued energies. So this became a very powerful metaphor for thinking of a time in between. That is it, is it the, are we the subsisting potentials that, that's not yet taken, but maybe they'll be actualized. Or maybe we're a past that never was. When you go to the future, maybe we'll have been this notion of, this notion of in betweenness is a past that actually never was. <laughs> um, so that's the um, kind of theoretical part of the wrap up. But I wanted to share, um, we, we talked about moving from, uh, the larger frame here is about moving from sense making to sense fullness. And I wanted to share this uh, short video, I think it's four minutes with you to revisit this other aspect that we're trying to hold on to in this presentation. I'm going to stop share so I can make sure the system audio is on. Um, okay. So that's good that I did that. Okay.
If we are in a time of transition, whether you think of it as a great crisis or emergent possibility or both, then the path ahead is not going to be shaped by just taking existing information and mashing it up in new ways, or taking existing knowledge and building it up into more complex forms. Rather, we must begin to sense and perceive the world in radically new ways. The mind is too coarse an instrument to gather deeper signals from the world. This is the role of the body as the sensorium, as the organ of sensing and perception. The mind is completely at a loss here because it cannot perceive what is emerging. We need our senses to gather the nectar, as it were, and serve it up to the mind where it can be concentrated into new meaning. This, however, requires us to remember ourselves, literally, to put our bodies back together in a way that we function as organs of perception. This is why all the relevant new ideas we see popping up come from people who are returning to simple but powerful embodied approaches to life through meditation, movement, extreme sports, and the arts. We must look deeper into the soil and the mycelium. We see that the forest originates from these fine threads of communication over vast territories of participation. The entire forest is an emergent pattern composed by finely textured processes of sensing and creative participation. This requires a great deal of trust and discipline, but there is also a great deal of pleasure and play involved because pleasure perfects work and play enlivens perception. There is a kind of holistic intertwining going on here. The rays of the sun are sensed by the leaves and the tiny filaments of the spider sense the texture of its web. It is to this level of perception we must go to recreate the world as it emerges anew through the power of our senses. Here, at the edges of the old world, a future already begins. Okay, um, so there is a coda to this um, that I, maybe we could ask people if they want to stay uh, for the coda, um, but um, maybe if we could just, if somebody can't stay and they have one or two questions, we could go to 11 and then we could spend the 10, 15 minutes on the coda. Um. Sure, yeah, that works, Bunny. Coda? Yeah. We have time to go extra with that. Okay, 
So let's do that. Uh, uh, the code is called metamorphosis and <clears throat> One of the things that I want to make is this notion of metamorphosis is not a linear transformation. And while researching this, I, I, I wanted to use the word chrysalis, but I didn't know what was the difference between a chrysalis and a cocoon. And a cocoon is a moth creates kind of a spin silk around itself and then changes and change, you know, undergoes a change within that. But in a chrysalis, as you can see here, um, the change comes from the inside out. It starts to dissolve on the inside first and then starts to make this skin, exterior skin. So the change comes from the inside out. And I thought this is really the perfect metaphor for our time that something has to that 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 the change is happening from inside us something has to change inside us these notions of time change and causality has to come from the inside and then the new emerges as a result but we can still get trapped in a modern mentality so for example when we think about the caterpillar and the butterfly, when we think about metamorphosis as a modern, we tend to think of like as modern caterpillars, we only wanna get bigger, stronger, grow more legs and eat more. And then we see ourselves as modern butterflies and we just wanna grow bigger wings, fly faster and lay more eggs. So we don't, real metaphor, me, metamorphosis isn't interested in like being a better caterpillar on one end or better butterfly on the other end. Real metamorphosis is interested in what's happening in here. The chrysalis is never, hardly ever welcomed and never invited. And this is our, what I want our relationship to be in our time between worlds. We wanna welcome this as its, its unique experience. Not waiting to be, you know, not thinking of ourselves as when we were caterpillars, when we could make sense of things or waiting to be really good butterflies. To welcome and to invite the chrysalis. So, I know most of the time was spent on deconstructing because it's really hard to get un disembedded from these. Um, but I've tried to present some alternative points of view in which time is not linear, change is not advanced, and we're causal forces in our, not systems that deanimate their parts. It is a view where maturity and ripeness, senensis and decay, as well as disappearances and vanishings, create crucial openings for the game of life to go on. Neither progress nor compounding evolutionary pressures can account for metamorphosis. Metamorphosis requires openings and openings require the old form to be taken out of existence. So uh, Hannah Arendt has this uh, uh, quote, the light that illuminates processes of action appears only at the end, frequently when all the participants are dead. So, the story of our time between worlds is probably hidden from us, even with the words we dispatch to readers of the future. You remember this from the first slide that we've, we're dispatching these in a box. The very richness of the in-between world makes it imperceptible to us. 
Once on the other side, you see I have to use modern linear phraseology here. We may forget again what it was like to be in the uncanny position of acting without knowing and moving while still wondering where to go. Here, however, we have the chance to appreciate the incredible impossible journey of being transported from one world to another without needing to know how exactly it is happening. Along the way, we should not hope to be remembered for our actions because we don't know what we're doing. Rather, our hope is to be appreciated, nor should we expect to be understood by future generations. More likely, the mystery we are to ourselves will be permanent. Just as the sages of old, those forces of apocal change and emergence, the ancients reified as men are still a mystery to us today. So this is, of, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm going to end with a little vision. Who are we then, these people assembled at the end of the world? And I call ourselves the extemporarians. We just have to act ad hoc. And I'm going to end with this. It's all, um, all these slides are from uh, Mobius. It's called Utopia, the game of life. Can you hear the system sound?
And so the idea here is from this perspective, it's as if we've given up on life. How many forms of life could we be? As, as moderns, we've, we've only want, the, we want everything to be one way of living, one kind of life form, because that makes, that makes sense. That would be shared sense making. And all those potentials that Mobius sees, they all subsist. How many forms of life could we become? That's what is exciting to me. Lots of silent applause, Benita. Yeah, so thank you uh, for being on this journey uh, with me. And um, what Peter uh, <clears throat> has suggested that we have two um, kind of open mic question and answer 90 minute sessions to follow up on this, this series and people who are just watching the recordings um, can, you know, can also come and have seen the whole series and really ask questions about um, some of the implications of this and maybe get into some of the, the more complex uh, conceptual territory if you'd like. So, um, yeah, so um, I think, I don't know if he put the dates up yet, but there'll be two 90 minute uh, uh, series for, for more participation, for you guys to ask questions, for you guys to, uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts and like what part you really like or what part really like kills you and um, where your imagination was grabbed and uh, where your mind was tugged. So um, yeah, so we could have a, maybe a few comments to, uh, to close out. Um, and, uh, um, yeah. Okay. So we'll take a few, few questions here in the next 15 minutes, um, or comments. Um, so please put questions, um, in the chat. I'm reading the chat now, so there's a lot going on. People, you know, people have been writing poetry and um, drawing and yeah, it's really nice to see how it's kind of stirred other types of imaginations and creativity. Um, um, I'll make a comment, Benita, that maybe you can respond to, which is just, you've really guided us through for, for a, um, virtual digital presentation, a very embodied experience of this different mode. And so at the beginning of the series, I found more conceptual kinds of questions arising and sort of analytical, e even as I recognized what it was. And then um, probably about halfway through the series, I there's just this state shift where I was like floating in this pool of the numinous. And it's such a discreet kind of shift. I, I keep trying to either take things from modernity and like smuggle them into the numinous, or I try to take things from, from complex potentials and, and bring them back into modernity. Yeah. I'm wondering if you can comment on that, that divide. Yeah, so that toggle is, is, it's beautiful that you experienced it. Um, if you go back and look at the presentations, you'll see that traps also in my presentation. Like, like when I say we look into the future and we'll see ourselves as other, well, that's a modernist frame. But then I turn it around and kind of, kind of say, but if, we look at the animals and we see them ourselves and we see, oh, look what kind of form of life we've become. Look, 
look at the form of life we were. There's this is like toggling because it's very hard. Uh, our lang you have to use language from modernity, but then you're using the images or the, the construction of the journey is not quite letting you be in that framework, even though those words are there. Uh, the very first uh, session someone wrote, when I, we were talking at time from an indigenous perspective, someone wrote, uh, time's always been like that for us, we just got there first, you know? So like, it was the same thing, like noticing uh, the toggling back and forth and, 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 and not being able to escape like you said, bringing it back into modernity. I mean, we can't quite pull the whole thing off, right? If that's what's being pulled off. Um, but when you, like for me, it's, it's um, my, my choices and my decision-making are now from this frame, pretty much. I mean, I, not, I choose like my meat, my meat's gonna expire in two days. You know what I mean? There's a, there's a place for modernity, but when I think about larger questions and larger issues, it's your, it, I, I know it's, it, it is possible to enter these frames and then come up with different perceptions of what is and, and how you can act in that. Um, yeah. Um, and I think the first, and exactly the first, very first thing we, I had to really frame what we were doing. There was a lot of conceptual framing and you guys um, really, it, it just, you know, picked that up and sustained it through the whole, uh, the whole uh, series. So, which was very happy to see because that, you know, it's a lot of, it's a, it's a big cognitive and embodied load, right? I mean, um, So we've got a few questions in the chat. We should have time for um, the two or three that I see there. Um, Andy, if you'd like to ask your question and unmute yourself. Happy Halloween. Oh yeah. Wow, holy Hello. cow. Halloween. <laughs> so two things. One, through what skills do we facilitate unfolding of others' potential? Some people have mentioned coaching is a way to do it, but I'm having trouble visualizing how you could scale that since that seems such an intimate improvisational thing. And then question two is, is the concept of adaptation itself a zero sum game? And if so, how can we reframe it to make it more an unfolding and how would that be helpful? Yeah, these are really good questions and I'm really loving it because there's this embodied experience of this, but this work is meant to go into real territory like that. I'm gonna answer the second one first um, about adaptation. I think uh, adaptation, um, complex adaptive systems thinking is um, inevitably self-closing, self-accelerating and self-closing. So. Um, and, and these things, a lot of these things um, are useful in early stages like capitalism and then self-terminating in later stages. Um, so, and, and, I ha and also to remember that um, complex adaptive systems thinking is not the same as what Darwin actually said. I call it the Darwinian attitude in here, which is entangled in complex adaptive systems. Because Darwin said, you know, the environment is doing its thing and mutations are doing their thing and it's random. And as the environment changes, then some of these random mutations fit better in, uh, in some agents and not in others. There's no such thing as evolutionary pressure. Mutations aren't happening because people are adapting to, you know, none of that's happening in real, like Stephen Jay Gould and real Darwinian, Darwin's real theory of evolution. None of that's happening. What we've done is we've, we've put this, some of these assumptions of modernity into that and made, made it into 
the Darwinian attitude. So I would say evolution's more open, complex adaptive systems thinking is inevitably uh, closed, escalates complexity and is closed, has closure, I, I think. Um, now the first question is very interesting because this is the paper I'm trying to write on education to approach education from this potential states theory. What's really hard is in this case, you have to get rid of the developmental lens. It's, ve it's very hard as an educator and being through integral theory and all of this to not see, okay, I'm coaching them from here to there. Like, and one of the real problems with that is that you don't see the emerging pathways. You see anything that's new emerging in children as deviant. You, you will necessarily see it as deviant because it's not going that way. And the stage theory says it has to go through these stages. So some of those skills are, are, are I don't have a good answer for you because I'm trying to work some of it out. And, but some of these skills are like really having to um, not look at the child like they're not there yet. Or another thing that we do as facilitators is you don't know what direction is in the right direction. You really have to let that go. It's just change. Is it in the right direction? I don't know, because the human is a mystery to me. Um, but I can scaffold um, a relationship. If you watch the TED Talk, uh, the Hole in the Wall School, it shows how rural, uh, children in rural India who couldn't even speak uh, the, the, the national language, which I'm not sure what it is, they should know. Um, he put, a, he put a computer in a hole in the wall and they taught themselves how to use a computer, speak English, surf the internet. And when he came back, they asked for a, a, a stronger processor. And so somehow that's part of it. Like because in rural India, the, the, social, the social relationships were intact, that something like that is also possible, right? So there's a lot of pieces I have. Um, but I think those are a handful of skills. I mean, I, you know, there are some skills that I've kind of identified, um, but the, the real obstacle is what do I put in the place of a developmental attitude when I look at coaching or, uh, um, or children and all curriculum is highly developmental. Um, and we're doing a curriculum with a Montessori school in Washington DC right now, uh, a small project on leadership. And um, there's, there, it ro rotates with three different teachers and uh, well, four, I have a partner, we teach together. And the other two teachers are teaching much more. I mean, they're really very uh, game B type teachers, but still they're, they're quite, you know, they, they had people like read about leaders of the 21st century and high school kids like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, we're doing things like we have, uh, we, we like, what would, what would make this course interesting to you? And then instead of a drop down list, we just have poll everywhere and they just stop po start populating the poll and then, and then voting it up and down. And when we first started, uh, you know, they're high school kids. So occasionally you're on Zoom and one kid wears headphones, like Bluetooth headphones. And I swear to God, he's listening to music, not us. Like there's a lot of like, how do you get people involved? And we just, we don't react to it. Like we just, we just do, like what I did here. We just do the thing. And if they don't play with it, they don't play with it. And so sometimes there's a lot of tension and it's just, you know, and then they get motivated and um, they just, they have to work on a real life project. So uh, the other teachers wanted to like say homelessness, food security, and like do all that work for them. And I'm like, no, no, let's just ask them what they're interested in. They had 19 very, like 
indigenous sovereignty and climate change and their re and reproductive rights. This would have never come up in that group because they're all men. And like, like the the things they're interested in are really. I mean, I was like, wow, Be because we gave them a chance to like do whatever they do, anything. And someone came up with uh, the fast fashion industry. I thought that was really. I'm not sure what that was up, but it's like. So part of the skill is, um, you know, it's easier for us, me, because I'm not a teacher in that school. I don't have to like prove anything. Um, but part of the skill is really knowing there's potential in there. And a lot of it is like, uh, a lot of it is how do I create a performance? So they're not adapting the way stu students adapt to teachers and children relate to adults. See, they're caught too, right? They're kind of like, yeah, the student does this and then the teacher does this and then, yeah, we do that. Yeah, so really trying to, yeah, something like that. It's not really a tight answer, but that's kind of how it's more working with it. <clears throat> that's what really, those are, see, those are really great questions. Like. And you're for yourself too, you know, like we put so much developmental theory on ourselves and so we'll never get there. Like there's never, you know, it's all the same thing over and over and over again. And uh, um, you know, interestingly though, what this work does is like you could go from what the traditions do, what the Buddhists do, is they just say, they see that thought is problematic, that construing time like this is problematic and this, and then they just like, well then have no thought. And um, this is a little different. This is um, thought, you know, these, these constructions, these theory constitutive metaphors, they're, they're fun to build and they change your life and they change you know, it's 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 like discovering a new movie or a medium or something. And so if you don't let them capture you, if you don't get constrained by them, uh, they're 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 uh, and, and you can and we can learn how to create ones that are useful, like a new theory of education, noticing that developmental theory, I can use it sometimes, but when I'm limited to that what I'm signaling to the kid is, is you're never enough. Basically, you're never enough. And that's like staying in the chrysalis. Like, yeah, part of me knows that he's not there yet, but I wanna be here, right? Uh, and uh, what's the potential here? And it's very hard to do because of this developmental bias, this time, linear time change thing we have where progress is, Oh, he's in the future. I, I think it's, I think it's, I think um, for the kinds of minds uh, children have today, I think it's not appropriate um, model. So we are at time. Um, I'm looking forward to the Q and A, dedicated Q and A sessions. Um, I think they're going to be very rich. Uh, so we'll end here. Um, I put the slides from the first three parts, as well as the recordings in the chat. And um, this one will be up as well. I'm not sure when the Q&A sessions are scheduled. So just keep an eye on the STOA calendar. And um, any closing thoughts for us, Bonita? No, I'm just noticing like, um, how much fun it was to do the presentation I did, but also how much energy and eagerness and enthusiasm I have for the conceptual too. So um, I, I hope that the message was not to not be conceptual um, because that's part of, part of it too. Just don't, let's try not to be modern people when we think. Thank you, Benita. And just an extra big thanks for the amount of effort and heart that you put into this. It really 
uh, makes a huge difference. I feel like I'm on the receiving end of something that um, is really special. Thank you so much. Enjoy your weekend. Happy Halloween. <laughs>